and it doesn't matter who's, you know, who's perpetrating it. So, you know, if we could end this, you know, the utopian thing was if we could, we could end domestic violence as we know it, we would live in a, in a safer, more peaceful world. But if we can put a dent in it, we can certainly make a difference. Mr. Rivers, your answers to our questions are as compelling as your speech. But I thought of another thing you didn't include was the word bullying. I can remember as a child of five. Um, I also can remember that bullying can continue on throughout your life. Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, well, I mean, I did, I did actually discuss bullying slightly in, in, in my presentation. And, and uh, the, the reality is, is that that type of behavior, usually there's a connection between the bully and why he bullies. And I would venture to say, and, and, you know, and I don't have those statistics, but in most cases, a child who comes to school and becomes a bully is because somebody's bullying him somewhere else. And this is how he can take control of the situation. And so, and then of course, if you get away with it, then you get away with it for a long time and, 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 uh, and nobody really confronts you. And I'll use the example from an athletic standpoint. Uh, Mike Tyson was an amazing heavyweight champion because he was such a bully in the ring until somebody stood up to him. And Mike Tyson was no longer the bully in that situation, you know, in, in the ring. And so the, the fact is, is if, if a bully is confronted, a lot of times we find out that, you know, that they're actually cowards and they're only picking on the smallest and meekest people that they can, they can get away with. And it is an issue that's being addressed in our schools. It is, it's not perfectly being, you know, it's, it, there's no perfect answer to it at the moment, but we know that our schools have a big increase in bullying. And, uh, and I just think that, you know, that's part of how we raise our young boys and girls. So, you know, this room has a lot of influence. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, all of us can influence the world, but actually it's our kids who can change the world and they can change it for the better. And that's why well, I'm so glad that you guys are here so that maybe, you know, you can hear some, some of this and, and say, you know what, maybe I can change my behavior. Maybe I can be one of those men that stands up and says, you know what, that's unacceptable. And so, you know, this is, this is the, you know, why I'm so happy that we have young people in the room because hopefully they can change that behavior. Mr. Rivers, I wonder, did your mother, who sounds a little bit like a saint, uh, ever say anything about, I wonder what happened to the man that I married and fell in love with? Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a question that, that is, is, I hear a lot is, you know, what, what was my father like or where did he come from? So basically my father from, in, in, in Cuba, my father came from a very wealthy, powerful political family. And my mother came from the exact opposite. So she thought she married into the Cinderella story. And that changed on her wedding night. But the difference in those times, you have to remember, one, she didn't want to shame her father by running home the next day. And two, she was married in the Catholic Church. At that time, divorce was totally unacceptable. And then before too long, of course, my brother Tony came along, then I came along, and I mean, there were six children in our family. And uh, so I, when I was uh, writing my book, A Private Family Matter, the, the, that I did a lot of research on my father's family. And I knew my uncle and aunt, you know, his brother and sister, and they were beautiful, loving individuals that raised great families here in the United States and no violence in that household. And, and to my knowledge, everybody called my grandmother a saint. And, you know, I'm just assuming that it's different times like my time, you know, they, he might have gotten, you know, some, a switch or a spanking maybe growing up. but. Um, uh, you know, he came from a real, like I say, a, apparently a very loving home, and of course he was spoiled, and, and uh, uh, because he had a lot of money, he came to school here in America and whatnot. But uh, I obviously think that my father, there was something uh, wrong with him that just got progressively worse. Because and back then you didn't get help. Even when I asked my mom today, I asked my mom and go, Mom, you know, you should go talk to somebody who really help you, and and, she, and she'll say, oh, that's about locos. That's for crazy people. I go, no, it's not. You know, I want to go, you know, get a little therapy. She goes, no, no, different generation. So she says, no, no, that's for crazy people. I'm not going. So, yes. Mr. Rippers, um, the face of violence today is really the Chris Brown, Rihanna story. And I believe you may have done some speaking on Larry King about that. Mm -hmm. But in, in you talked about the youth. But most young people that I've even heard recently seem to think that Rihanna did something wrong. She calls did. Uh, what, what do you think triggers that behavior, especially even in young girls and young boys in particular, who both uh, overwhelmingly feel that kind of uh, a thing is a place, uh, was, was a cause? Well, I mean, I mean absolutely. It's, it's interesting because I spoke at two high schools over the last few months since the Rihanna Chris Brown uh, uh, violent episode happened. And, uh, and I got to tell you that there was about 50% of the girls that said, well, she must have done something. And I was like, really? 
And, and, you know, and, and so I think that, that that really is, we have to sort of change that whole ideology, and that's going to have to start really young, because the fact is, is that you know, when, when we're, we're saying that because, of, because she looked at his cell phone and read some of his messages that allowed, that gave him the right to beat on her like that, no, no, that's not right. And, and you know, did she do something wrong? Yeah, probably. And, and did she invade his privacy? Maybe. That still doesn't give him the right to beat on her. And, and so, you know, I just think that we have, to, we have to educate our young kids. And it has to start in our schools at this age. As people say, oh, no, you can't talk to little kids about this issue. Well, you know what? I was younger than that, and I remember things from when I was three and four years old today that happened to me. And so, you know, these kids can handle it. And if they're given, they're given these tools and the skills to treat each other with respect and kindness, they, it can really make a difference. So I do think we have to talk to our young kids. Not wait till they get to high school when there's a lot of peer group pressure. And, you know, when men stand up in high school and then try to, you know, say something about, hey, man, you shouldn't talk like that, you know, they get ragged on by the other guy. And, and they get called all, all kinds of pretty horrendous names for doing it. So it's, it's going to take, it's going to take kind of a bold effort. It's going to take a few courageous men you know, especially our young men to start standing up until it becomes a movement that we say no, no to this behavior. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to Victor Rivers, actor, author, and national spokesperson for the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.